Welcome everyone from Oak Carolina. So excited. We're going to get started real quick. And I just want to give you some announcements, not that you probably haven't seen this world, but I just want to make sure you know that um, you don't miss something. We have a lot going on at the library in September and October. So in October, October 4th, we will have Marla Mackin, and she's going to be talking about her book, The Dragon's Tale. But of course, she's bringing information on we want you to know that she is an author and this she's done a lot of work on this. She's gonna bring the information and uh um, you can be able to get a picture of whether she liked it or not. Um, and then in um, November. On November 8th, which will be the second Wednesday of the month, and that is because the staff will, four of us will be at Kansas Library Association the first Wednesday of the month. So uh, we're honoring veterans that, that week, and so on the 8th, and so we will have a Kansas Humanities speaker, Neuro Needle, and he will be talking about um, the generation of veterans for Iraq and Afghanistan, so do come. And if you do know uh, veterans um, that usually attend the Rotary presentation, they will be they will be hearing that at Rotary. They'll be speaking in both places. Just so if you miss it on, if you can't make it on Tuesday at Rotary, well, if you can make it on Wednesday. Um, December I'm still working on, so if you know of anybody who likes to do something for Christmas, let me know. Um, Donna Henry and Kelly Henry and myself were bringing a program to Kansas Humanity called Talk About Literature, and this month we're reading New to the World by Paulette Giles, and um, yeah, Patrick, uh, our board chairman, he has a great book, and you know, he was so, and loves literature. He said that is a great book. So, we have about 20 copies upstairs if you want to read it. Do, and then we have a humanity speaker um, that will come on the 27th at 7 p.m. and talk about the book with us. They, they won't just tell us about the book, they'll interact with us about the book. That will be at the library. And then, if you love to paint, but really, you know, either you're really great at it or maybe you don't, you're not really great at it, it's like me. We're having a paint party on September 17th, and um, our artist teacher here, uh, Christine Mountford, is right here, and she's going to be doing it at the library. It's about $40. $10 goes to the library as a uh, library fundraiser, um, and the rest will go to help her pay her a little bit. But it's, a lot of it goes for the canvas, the paint, all of the, all of the, the Paint brushes, you name it, the tablecloth, she brings everything to life. So I don't, we don't have to go and buy everything. Normally we buy everything by the time we take that and just be easy. I don't want to do it. So, um, and this is what we're going to be doing. You know, uh, catalog book is not appropriate for October. And if you don't know how to use a QR code or don't want to go online, sign up. We do have a sign up sheet upstairs that you can try to sign up. We can help you. Okay. Um, and then we're working with the college for the third Thursday of the month, and we have um, Carrie Swider, Swider coming, and he does pen and ink and um, watercolors and things. And he'll be here September twenty first, which is Thursday night, from six to eight p.m. Because there's not as many uh, businesses downtown with art, and they ask us, we do it. We think we'd love to. So we'll be upstairs. And then um, along with uh, one of our or uh, trustees, Nathan Perenic. Uh, he is here. He's going to um, help us with moderator events for the um, school board election. And so, those that want to come, those people that are running want to come, you can come and answer questions. If you have a question you want them to answer, would you please fill out a form or send us an email and we'll put that in? And that will be October 11th at 7 p.m. downstairs. Okay. Right. We have story time going on. If you know, if you have little ones that are visiting or or just want to, you think that your kids they need to come, your grandkids need to come, or they're visiting. This is a walk-in. You can just come in and be with you. 
And then we have lapsid, which is a sign of that's from zero to uh, zero to 15 months. And that's where our kids, the caregivers, grandparents, parents, mom and dad, uh, can come and sing songs and do, do rhymes and do all kinds of things with Judy. And by the time they're done with that six weeks, they will have really developed into um, really fun traits. And it's really important for the development. So think about that. Even if you have a grandchild, be a little for a man. And then Judy's putting out our touring walk on September 23rd at the West uh, West Moore Street Park. Okay. We'll be looking for that. That was the end. And then our yak hours for our kids is 3 to 530, Monday through Friday. And then we have a new we have an ESL class, which is only on Thursday night at 6 30. But we have a new one that we're advertising for Monday. And at 30 by um, Cornette, uh, the ESL class, she's speaking in and Spanish, and so she has time to do a morning class on Mondays. And so we're going to try that out. So that's really exciting. Hopefully, I'll be able to do a little bit more than what you can find out to help us. And then, of course, if the weather gets bad, remember you can find your car announcements on Facebook, um, our website, and then on the catalog. So there are three ways you can find out their exposure. And then don't forget Libby, which is our digital books on your phone or tablet or computer. And then we love the same. And then just I want to thank you guys for helping to be the 2022 um, South Public Library on the South Public Library year. We haven't heard about 2023, but to make it once is quite a quite a foundation for our library. Mm -hmm. Now, now let me get mm -hmm. Now let me um, welcome Michael Stewart. He's bringing his book, um, yeah, Will Be Shaken, and he's from Topeka. I think we'll enjoy this, this talk. Um, he would have like an engineering investigation for our industry. Yeah, so come on in, Michael. I'll put my job. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Great. <clears throat> I'm just an engineer. That's the uh, catchphrase of my main character, Rose Haley, in the book, The Hills Be Shaken. I'm just an engineer, but that's also my catchphrase because that's what I am. I'm an engineer also. I design streets and highways. Um, I've always grown up loving engineering. Uh, and as a kid, I would tinker in the garage uh, with my dad's tools, building inventions. That's what I call them. Um, my parents weren't surprised that I ended up being an engineer. They could tell. Um, it was, they knew it was in my blood. Um, in fact, quite literally, it was in my blood because I'm a third generation civil engineer. Um, my dad and I used to, uh, every Monday night, we'd watch MacGyver together. We never missed it. That was our favorite show, uh, where the main character is an engineer uh, fighting bad guys. And uh, I really enjoyed it. I, after MacGyver, there really wasn't anything quite like that. The engineer is a main character um, getting into trouble. My grandpa, the first generation civil engineer, moved my dad's family to Pierce, South Dakota when he was a kid to help build the Wahi Dam, which is dams up the Wahi Lake in Pierce, South Dakota. The lake is huge. It goes all the way from Pierce, South Dakota to Bismarck, North Dakota. And at the time when the dam was completed, it was the second largest dam of its kind in the whole world. Uh, so I'm proud of my grandpa that he was part of that. Um, but it's no surprise that I have um, kind of a keen interest in dams, dams that could collapse. Uh, say to a uh, earthquake or an terrorist attack. Um, but more about the book in a minute. Um, as a young teen 
in the nineties, I would, uh, when I first started really reading for, uh, for my own entertainment, when I didn't have to read because it was assigned in school, I gravitated towards two authors that I really liked at first. Uh, Michael Crichton was one of them. Uh, a lot of science, but also fun action thrillers with science within. Uh, Jurassic Park was the first uh, first book of his that I read, and then I, of course, is a you know went on to be very successful movie, of course, and all that. So um, just loved Michael Crichton. Um, the next author I read was John Grisham. He, I read The Firm, and I remember that at the end of it, I just couldn't stop turning pages. I had to finish it. There was a lot of action at the end, and um, a lot of build up, and it was just wonderful. And uh, John Grisham was a lawyer, and he, his main characters are lawyers, so he puts lawyers in his books. He sort of invented the legal thriller in the and it was at a time when they said nobody's gonna want to read a thriller about a lawyer for him. but i think denzel washington and julia roberts and sandra Bullock have shown that um, they've made some pretty unboring movies out of those books so uh, I think there's definitely proof there. Uh, what John Grisham did that was his gift, I think, was obviously, first and foremost, he could write a good a good story, a good thriller that kept you entertained. But also, he found a way to include legal stuff <laughs> in his books uh, without dumbing it down, but also uh, again, keeping you entertained and you could learn a lot about the legal um, legal careers and that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, again, I think that was a gift he had. He invented the engineering, the, he invented the legal thriller. And so I like to say I invented the engineering thriller. So that's what I'm trying to do is kind of following his footsteps. Uh, Mose Haley, the main character in my book, The Hills Be Shaken, um, He's just like me. He's just an engineer. Uh, he's a Kansas engineer, and uh, the Tuttle Creek Dam in Manhattan, the Little Apple, uh, collapses on the 4th of July and floods uh, the city of Manhattan, and a lot of people die. Um, when it first happens, there's sort of a fog of, of uh, information that is coming out. No one really knows what's going on. There's conspiracy theories. Uh, the, the national media is calling it Little 9-11. Uh, nobody knows if it was an earthquake that caused it, if it was an attack. And if it was an attack, will there be another one? What's, what's going to happen next? These are the kind of things people are dealing with on the day of the disaster. Uh, the first nine or 10 chapters of the book kind of focuses on that, that, that first day, the, the, the disaster itself happens right in chapter one. So it gets going right away. And then you see all this, all the, uh, as the day unfolds, all the confusion that goes on. Well, in the days that follow, the uh, FBI decides they're gonna start recruiting engineers to help investigate this disaster, but also to help plan and prevent for any future attacks. If this was in fact attack, we don't really know. Um, so the main character of those Haley gets recruited by the FBI to become an FBI agent. Um, so that's really what this book is about. It's engineering term caught. If, if I can boil it down to three words, that would be it. Um, but he makes mistakes. As I said, he's just an engineer. So he stumbles around. He uh, gets in trouble with his bosses, but he also, because he's an engineer, he asks questions that no one else would ask. And when he gets into trouble, he thinks of clever ways to get out of those jams in only a way an engineer could. Uh, a little bit MacGyver. So uh, again, I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, I always loved having that engineer as a main character in, in action. Show, and so that's what I'm trying to do here. 
Um, at the heart of this thriller is a page turning mystery, but also uh, there are real characters that you'll get to know and root for. Um, that'll keep you wondering and, and seeing what's going to happen to him. You'll be biting your nails nervous. What's going to happen to him? Um, the Hills Be Shaken, the name of the book, you might be wondering what that means. Um, it's kind of a double meaning. Um, the, the, the disaster, of course, takes place in Flint Hills of Kansas where it's thought to be an earthquake that causes the collapse. So the hills are literally shaken. So that's one of the meanings, the hills be shaken. The other meaning is from the Bible, uh, Isaiah chapter 54, uh, which says, the mountains may fall and the hills be shaken, but God's love will not fall. And that's really the, that's really the main theme of the book is that this community is devastated by this disaster and there's no way they're going to get through it uh, unless they rely on God and rely on each other to get through it. Again, that's why I chose the top that it was be shaken. It's kind of the main theme for the book. Um, but yeah, it's something I believe in. I'm a believer in God. Um, my family, we are churchgoers. I have uh, I have six lively children, uh, five of them boys. Oh, wow. okay. so, my wife is is a living saint for sure. Amazing woman um, for putting on the me and the five boys. Um, but yeah, we're uh, you know we're a religious family. We are we like movies. We like I like science as an engineer. So. I try to, you know, those are things that regular people do. So I try to have my characters in the book do those things as well. Um, some people uh, want to keep religion out of books, but it's regular people who are doing these things. I want my characters to feel as real as possible. Um, I mentioned, yeah, so I'm, a, I, I'm religious, I believe in God, but I also am a believer in science as an engineer. Um, I've given a TED talk on, um, Holograms, so that's a lot of fun. You should check that out. Um, speaking of fun, I've also um, I also have the uh, world record in um, Back to the Future on the Nintendo. <laughs> I know that's kind of random, but <laughs> I'm an engineer that can accomplish some of but kind of a random. I'm, I'm a strange person. So. <laughs> Um, I wanted to read uh, a little bit out of the book. Um, this this is right in the, this is right in the middle of the book, a chapter right in the middle. And what happens? Uh, there are no witnesses of the uh, disaster at the when the dam collapses, uh, but there is one person that was there. But they had amnesia and. It sort of clears up towards the middle, and you hear what happened in sort of a flashback. Um, I wanted to open the book with this chapter, actually. Um, I think if it becomes a movie, this will be a great opening scene to the movie, which is why I'm going to read it to you guys. Um, but I just didn't fit right for a book. It didn't make a good opening for a book. Um, it, it, just, it, it just didn't work. So I had to kind of go to the film and make it a flashback. But, um, Anyway, that's kind of the premise. This is a person who witnessed what happened and he's telling his story for the first time uh, on the news. So that's, that's what's going on here. You can drink your water if you guys don't mind. Fox News was switching to a local story, an interview by ABC News' own Gail Gates. The caption at the bottom of the screen read, Little 9-11's only survivor speaks. On the screen, Gail said, Billy Schaefer is the only known survivor of Little Apple's 9-11, but until yesterday, he couldn't remember a thing. All at once, he awoke and his amnesia vanished. He's here to tell us finally what happened that day. The camera zoomed out to show Billy. They were sitting in the living room of the Joneses' farm. 
She sat on a couch, and he sat across from her on the recliner. Billy, first of all, thank you for agreeing to talk to not only me, but to the entire nation. I'm sure I'm speaking for all Americans when I say our hearts go out to you, and we are truly thankful. Yes, ma'am. Okay, Billy, why don't you start at the beginning? Billy said, I'm 16. My family is from McPherson. We were camping, <laughs> camping. My dad took a few days off of work so we could spend the fourth at the lake, which was great because my dad works at the refinery, usually putting in 70 hours a week. For him to take a few days vacation was practically a miracle. He laughed and continued. We had just finished cleaning up after breakfast. We had fried eggs. The smoldering campfire from the night before had a few remaining coals. We set the cast iron skillet right on top of them coals. Best eggs I ever had. My mom and sister had washed the dishes. I'm two years older than her. My dad and I were loading up the cooler for the boat. He kept saying, Billy, don't forget the hot dogs. We gotta have the hot dogs, Billy. Like it was the most important thing in the world. Billy stopped. He shook his head and covered his eyes with one hand. It's okay, take your time, Gail said. He nodded and took a deep breath. We were out on the water. It was beautiful. I don't remember ever seeing so many boats. It was a classic American Fourth of July day. We had stopped in a cove, and we all swam. My mom and dad floated on the same inner tube the whole time. They each had a beer, and they were holding hands. Billy smiled. They were like teenagers sometimes. I never doubted they were in love. My sister and I tried to get mom and dad with cannonballs off the boat. They were just out of our reach. Finally, after a while, we got back in the boat and we skied for a bit. I went first, then my sister. She had a good run, then we came back on the boat. My sister and I both had towels over our shoulders. She was dripping wet from skiing. Then my dad suggested we anchor down in another cove to get the grill fired up. My sister was chugging a Gatorade and she nodded dramatically. I nodded too. We had worked out quite an appetite. My dad finished pulling the ski rope in when we heard it, the explosion. We were somewhere in the south half of the lake, so we were close enough to see the dam and see the explosion. It came from the spillway, Gail said. How do you know it came from the spillway? Well, I don't know for sure, but you know that tower that lakes have? There in the water near the dam, it rises up as high as the top of the dam. Anyway. I think those were usually directly above the intake of the spillway. When the explosion went off, water between the spillway tower and the dam shot straight up, creating a white column of air, white column of water hundreds of feet in the air. Then when the water fell back down, that was it. That was it, Gail said. Well, nothing happened, at least not right away. We thought it must have been some sort of fire. I mean, it was loud, really loud. But you don't know what to think in a situation like that. So we were getting ready to cove up when we realized we were moving. But it was weird. It wasn't that we were moving past everyone else in the lake. We were all moving together. We could tell because it felt like all of us boats on the lake were standing still while the trees were moving past us upstream. But we know that's not what was really happening. We were the ones moving, like G.I. Joe's in the bathtub towards the drain. That's when we saw the spillway tower fall over. Then within a few seconds, a portion of the dam imploded on itself. We were being sucked into the dam, just like those G.I. Joe's. I yelled, Dad! And he yelled back, I know! And he jumped behind the wheel. After he started the engine, he threw the throttle forward hard. My mom had been standing up near the front. She fell and slid to the back of the boat, hitting her head on the heavy rail. I was close by, so I held her up in my seat. My dad turned around and asked if she was okay. She was holding the back of her head in pain, but she nodded. The boat was moving upstream in the lake, but I looked at the distant shoreline on either side of us. It appeared we were standing still. People in tubes, people with skis attached to their feet, People in sailboats, they were all coming at us so fast. 
My dad swerved back and forth to miss them. Dad, we need to try to save them, I had said. Billy sniffed. He said we couldn't. We had no way to help them, and if we tried, we would die. He was right. Just then I yelled, Dad, look out. A capsized, capsized boat was coming right for us. We didn't have time to swerve. My dad jerked the wheel, sending my sister flying sideways from one side of the boat to the other. She hit her temple on the corner floor, and she lay there motionless on the floor of the boat. I took a step towards her, just as we impacted another boat. We had sideswiped. Our nose was high because we were going so fast. So when we made contact, we sort of rammed over it. But at the time, since it wasn't a straight, since it wasn't a straight, we were corkscrewing through midair. When we finally landed, it felt like we were sideways, but we somehow managed to rotate back outside the wind. I was flung forward and I was on the deck near the front of the boat. Billy paused and took a breath. That's when I noticed my sister, her body hanging limply at the starboard side rail. She was about to fall in the water when my dad grabbed her ankle. He held her with both hands, not even watching anymore where the boat was heading. My sister's upside down body was bouncing off the surface of the water about once a second. I looked in front of the boat and saw a person in the water flailing their arms. We were headed right for them. I crawled to the wheel and jerked it to the right, sending us past the person. When the boat went right, my mom slid to the left side of the boat. Just then we hit someone on a jet ski. The person flew in the air above the boat as the boat went right over the top of the jet ski. The person traveled through the air like a bag of laundry being thrown from a delivery truck. He collided with my mom, sending the two of them off the back of the boat into the water. Billy closed his eyes. A tear rolled down each side of his face. I went to the back of the boat and reached over the starboard rail for my sister's hands. They looked like rubber swinging off of her lifeless body as it rhythmically swung up and down. I finally got a hold of her wrist and was able to bring her in. My dad resumed the wheel just in time to miss another boat. The engine was starting to smoke. I could see the RPMs were maxed out on the technology. The needle was in the red. I looked over at the shoreline and it appeared we were once again not moving relative to it. I asked my dad if we could, should throw the anchor. He looked around a few times and nodded his head. I picked it up and secured the end of the rope to the boat. I started swinging the anchor, getting ready to toss it in. When we hit something, I don't know what we hit this time, but the anchor came out of my hands and the rope tangled around my dad's neck. The anchor sunk a few feet below the surface, pulling my dad hard against the rail of the boat. The rope was tied around him, but he was able to manage to say knife to me while he pointed to the storage compartment under the wheel. I reached in and found his fishing knife. I stood up to head for him when I slipped, dropping the knife. It started to slip past my dad, but he was able to just barely grab it. He started cutting the rope just as we went past another boat. Our anchor got tangled in the other boat, yanking my dad overboard. Then all the slack in the rope was gone, and we were being pulled by the other boat. My dad was skipping on the surface of the water, holding the rope that was around his neck with one hand, still clutching the knife with the other. Our engine stalled and we were now being dragged faster by the other boat. At that point, the shoreline was definitely moving in the wrong way. I went to the anchor rope and started pulling on it, trying to get it back in. He was waving me off. That's when I really began to sob. Gail handed him a tissue. Hey, you need to take a break, Billy, she said. He shook his head and continued. That's when I noticed my dad trying to cut the rope but he was cutting it on the side of him. He was cutting on the side of him that our boat was on, not the side of the other boat. He knew I would die trying to save him, so he cut himself loose. I yelled for him as he started drifting away, but he loosened the severed rope from his neck and yelled, save your sister. We began to spin in circles as I went to start the engine back up and continue upstream. My dad zoomed away from us towards the gaping chasm in the dam. I knew I'd never talk to him again. The boat continued upstream, but it didn't last long. After a few minutes, it finally died. It had run hot for too long. Within seconds, we were drift drifting back downstream with the current, heading for doom. We were spinning again as we traveled. 
I didn't know what else to do, so I lied down next to my sister and held her tight with both arms. I had just enough time to say a quick prayer, then we flipped. I blacked out at that point, and the next thing I know, I was on the bank of the Big Blue River downstream of the dam. I was disoriented, and I just walked. I knew I wanted to walk away from the water. That's all I knew. Eventually, I made it clear to the Joneses' farm, and they took me in like a son. I will forever be grateful to them for that, and I will forever love them for that. Gail was wiping tears from her face. She said, Billy, your courage is amazing. You are a true American hero. I'm no hero, man. I'm just somebody who God has to bless so I can tell my story. You're amazing, Billy. You just found out your family was tragically killed and you consider yourself blessed? I have to consider myself blessed. I owe that much to them. They would want me to live for them. I miss them. I miss them every day of my life. Billy smiled and said, but I know I'll see them again someday. Thank you. Um, I love movies. Uh, I love uh, action movies like Die Hard, earlier movies like Seven. Um, so what really excited me about this book when I was writing it was um, I was so excited to sit down and write because I wanted to find out what was going to happen next. And that's what writing, the writing process is like for me is, is I have a basic idea what's going to happen, but I don't know all the details. And when, when I sit down to write, I get to see it come out and, uh, and that's all the fun. So I really enjoyed that. If this, if this were to be made into a movie, I would be the first one in mind to buy a ticket. Uh, so I really love this book. And I knew I loved it, but I didn't I didn't know how good it was or if it was good at all. I didn't believe in it when it was first published. Um, but then the reviews started coming in and they came in really well at first. Um, I started at they came, I was averaging four and a half stars on Amazon. Um, but I still didn't believe it. And then 50 reviews came in and the average was still up. Uh, and I didn't believe it, but now I have hundreds of reviews, uh, and the, the average is still high. People, people really like it, so <laughs> I'm starting to believe in this in this book. And that uh, people besides just me like it. people like my story of an engineer uh, caught up in a bigger world. Um, I just want to read a couple. These are a few things that. Some of the reviews and it's you know, it's on the poster and the handout but you know people say i will reread this shocking and moving a brilliant thriller you'll be flipping pages i give it six stars if i could um those are some of the you know i can go on uh, and read others but i really kind of want to just read one more review but not just a snippet out of it, but read the whole review. So you, I think this, this review would really capture what the book is about and what I was trying to do with this, with my story. Um, this is a NetGalley review. Uh, if you don't know what NetGalley is, it's sort of, it's a, um, it's a place for book critics to, uh, to uh, read books. They can get on and read the books for free so that they'll leave a review. But NetGalley will only let, um, they, they vet, who can be on there, so it's only, um, they have a bar where they don't, don't let anyone in, but it's just uh, kind of established book critics. Uh, anyway, um, here it is. The Hills Be Shaken is the second novel by American engineer and author Michael Stewart. When Tuttle Creek Dam near Manhattan, Kansas fails on the 4th of July, 10,000 people die. Officials claim it's due to an earthquake, but experts aren't convinced. The idea that it may have been a terrorist act gains momentum when there's a threat against a bridge somewhere in Kansas. Officer Sam McGuire recalls stopping an armed woman in Manhattan Park on that day. Detective Mickey Shepard feels they need more officers to question witnesses for clues about what happened. Retired FBI agent Don Baptiste has been recalled 
to do to investigate what happened really happened during the thing they call Little Apple 9 11. Topeka engineer Moses Haley lost a family member to the disaster. And while his expertise isn't with dams or bridges, a paper he's written brings him to the attention of the FBI and the Secret Service. He's stunned to be pulled out of his Sunday mass for an audience with the highest power in the land. But even more amazing is being recruited into a new division of the FBI, which includes learning to shoot a Glock 23. In concert with Manhattan PD, Moe's methodically investigates, picking up on small elements, uncovering clues, following leads, and making deductions. But as he and Sam get closer to learning the truth, their threats to his family, Moe's is shot at, almost drowns, and attempts are made on the lives of his colleagues. As well as a few engineers, Stewart populates his tale with corrupt county officials and engineering company managers, a persistent journalist, a sole survivor with amnesia, woman with hidden explosives expertise, and observant detail-oriented investigators. Before the final revelation, there is a bomb threat, a stabbing, a dramatic climax inside a wind turbine, and a spectacular helicopter rescue. Mose makes an interesting character as his engineering background often, often gives him a different perspective on what he learns and a different approach to investigation. The versatile perpetrator employs drowning, a motor vehicle accident, poisoning, and shooting, leading to a not insignificant body count. This is an excellent police procedural, and more of this cast will be most welcome. I just thought that was a Great review that cut it all. So like, um, the you know, one of the reoccurring things that comes up in a lot of the reviews is people how they say like the characters. The characters feel real. They feel three dimensional. They're flawed, um, which is something an author always wants to hear. They don't want to have flat characters. Um, and so, like, especially the main character, most people are like, "Oh, this is such a great flawed character." And again, I really like hearing that. And then I kind of got to think, well, Pose is really based on me. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of an insult to me, but. <laughs> um, I'm going to, uh, I'll take some questions in a minute. Uh, but first, I just wanted to say um, that I'll be, I've got books here um, that, I'll, that I'll be selling. Um, for uh, $10 a piece. They're, um, these goes for $12 on, uh, you know, Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble.com or whatever. Uh, it's $12 plus shipping, so you can save a lot if you, if you want a copy. Uh, they're $2 or something. Be happy to order that if you'd like. Um, I also have plenty of bookmarks up here, so please come up and grab a bookmark. Those are free. Um, I also brought my, this is my first novel, The Art Emulator and the Seven Keys, which is, um, this is a, uh, this is a global uh, conspiracy thriller, uh, kind of an adventure story. This is more of a, uh, an adventure thriller like Indiana Jones or Da Vinci Code. Um, so it's a little different. There's still plenty of uh, mystery and twists. Um, whereas uh, The Hills Be Shaken is more of a, kind of a classic crime history, and then this is more of an adventure thriller, but um, I'm selling those for $10 also, which is also a discount, so uh, happy to sell you one of those. I have a, um, I have a card reader that you don't have cash. Um, we can, I can scan your card. Um, so yeah, I think that's that. Uh, that's about it. Anybody have any questions? Great short. Oh, thank you. Given the fantastic proliferation of people, what is the role Wow, that's a very big question. <laughs> Just an engineer. <laughs> what 
you saying? Pardon? Uh, were you saying something? I thought, it, I think I, were you saying something? Pardon? Uh, no, I just said it. I wouldn't have asked the question, except I thought you were big enough to answer. <laughs> Well, written, the written word is always going to have a role. I think if that, that was your question, what role does the written word have? Um, and yeah, I mean, it's always going to be there. So we've got to. You know, the, you know, my book is published. It's always going to be there, so it's always out there. So I have to stand behind it. I think anybody who writes something needs to do the same thing, whether it's uh, a journalist or somebody just on social media, on Twitter or Facebook. It's it's going to be there forever, and it can be, and it should be. We want we want to have a record of what happened, so. The only way we can truly have a good record. Yeah. How did you decide to make Manhattan the Little Apple and everything in nine one one and blah blah blah? How did you come up with that? With that. Well, I was I was on a on the on a lake one day on a boat and just kind of thought, well, what would happen if the dam collapsed right now while I'm on the boat? What, what, would, what kind of chaos would it be? What would we try to do to save ourselves? And then I was like, oh, that would be a good scene for a book. So um, I kind of, that kind of led me to, um, you know, well, what this did happen, it could be investigated by an engineer, so I can engineer its main character. I still, that still didn't get me to Manhattan, but then, uh, you know, I went to K-State uh, to uh, get my engineering education. So I lived in Manhattan for quite a while, so I'm fond of, of the Little Apple. And um, it just kind of worked out. I was like, oh, it's Manhattan, Kansas, instead of Manhattan, New York. We can, we can uh, you know, treat, you know, kind of make it an analogous situation, again, where people do, you know, on the day it happened, it's just chaos. No one knows what's going on. And so it just kind of fit. Yeah. How did you start writing? <laughs> How did I start writing? Yeah, because you always wanted to be a writer. I I think I always did, but I never really knew how to get started. Um, and then about ten years ago, my wife started working overnight shifts at the hospital, and uh, she's a respiratory therapist. And uh, so I was alone. I had some nights where I was just alone. It was me and the kids. And frankly, I there was nights I'd get a little scared being all alone by myself. <laughs> but uh, no, I thought, well, what can I do to uh, to uh, kind of yeah? For one, the kids have been put to bed, and I've got a few hours just all by myself. But also, yeah, I mean, I get a little scared if I hear you know, a twig snapped outside or whatever. Can I bottle this fear somehow? So I, I just one day sat down and I was like, I'm just gonna write a kind of a scary scene. And, and uh, so I sat down and three hours later, I was still typing. I just didn't believe how much, how enjoyable it was. And again, I was seeing the scene unfold. Uh, it was just a simple scene of a person who was checking their, their back door to see if it was locked or not, but they were afraid to get too close to the back door because what if somebody came in right at that moment? That was a, a scene I heard uh, But yeah, I just wrote a scene and then it led to another story and I uh, and then started getting ideas and writing other stories. So that's kind of how it all started. <laughs> yeah. So many of the uh, young authors go to uh, uh, Iowa to the uh, writing workshop. Have you done that, or have you considered that? No, I haven't. Haven't done that. I haven't been doing that workshop in Iowa. I'd like to go. It's uh, uh, with the six kids. It's it's hard to get a find a time to get away. Uh, 
So did you kind of revert back to some of your uh, college uh, classes and you developed your writing skills? Um, no, I, as an engineering school, there isn't very much writing classes or anything like that. You know, it's all math and science. So um, I just kind of had to learn as I went. And uh, uh, I, I was never really that good at English or writing. Uh, so I just tried to start doing it. And the editing process, um, is 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 a huge way to get better at writing because learning how to edit and learning how to correct a novel made my next novel go a lot easier because I already had knew it before. And then editing that novel made the next novel easier to write. So yeah, I just kind of learned as I went. But again, the editing, the self-editing process was a big part of that. Just learning how to edit, not really learning how to write. So did you have a problem to get published? Well, I tried, I wanted to go traditional publishing and I queried many, many literary agents uh, asking them if they were interested. And unfortunately I didn't find any. And uh, that's why I, that, that was uh, the hills be shaken. So I couldn't find any interest. So I just put it away and I wrote the other book, the uh, Arch Emulator and Seven Keys. And I got done with it and did the same thing. And there wasn't any interest. And I finally decided I couldn't just let him sit for and not be out in the world because uh, I just didn't want to bottle that. I thought these, you know, these are good stories. I want to get them out there. So I self-published. So I went to self-publishing out. And uh, there's, it's, there's, it's a great time in history for that. It's just the easiest time ever to be able to solve that way. Thank you. Thank you for coming also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.